and podcast. Okay, it looks like we're now live. So uh, welcome everybody out there. Um, I should introduce myself. Um, I'm uh, James Morley. I'm a professor at macroeconomics at the University of Sydney. Um, and I teach both undergraduate macroeconomics and master's level macroeconomics courses. And what I wanted to do tonight is uh, just give um, a short sort of master class lecture on some of the economic policy lessons that we've learned from the COVID crisis. Um, and then at the end, we'll have uh, time for questions and answers. Um, but there's also the Q&A feature right here in Zoom. So um, anytime you have a, a question, you can en enter that in. Um, and I can either try to look at that as we go, but uh, definitely we'll, we'll come and look at that at, at the very end. So um, just as a, a background for this uh, masterclass, I, we're now more than a year on from really the, the big onset of the, the, the COVID crisis um, as a, an economic crisis, in addition to, of course, the, the pandemic itself. And um, about a year ago, I was part of a group of economists that sent a letter to the prime minister uh, arguing that there wasn't a trade-off between health and the economy. Um, and, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. And so we had predictions at the time about what economic principles would say would be a good policy response to the crisis. And so I thought it would be good sort of a year on to look back a bit retrospectively and see um, how did we do with those predictions and what lessons can we draw um, and also think uh, towards the future in terms of uh, potential long run consequences, uh, economic consequences of the, the crisis. So uh, let, let's get started. Um, I did want to be, begin starting by uh, acknowledging country um, and, and uh, acknowledging the tradition of custodianship and the law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. Um, I'm on the Camperdown campus, uh, which is, is uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So we pay our respects to those who have cared and continue to care for country. Um, I always like to start any kind of lecture with a, a bit of motivation and, and um, I guess I wanted to motivate that uh, for whatever reason uh, I seem to be slightly obsessed with pandemics because I, here's an exam question I wrote for my undergraduate macro class um, back in 2018, long before we had any notion that there might be a, um, the pandemic. Um, I'm not going to ask you to answer this question tonight. But um, the basic point of the question was it was this very, hope, hopefully at the time, hypothetical scenario of um, the Australian economy being hit by a, an epidemic, and I said a flu contagion like the Spanish influenza of 1918 that killed more than 50 million people worldwide. Um, and I had the very grim prediction of a big uh, wiping out of, of the Australian workforce as a result of that. And I asked the questions to students on the exam, um, what would be the effects of that on the level of output in the economy? Um, and what would be the effect of it on what economists refer to as the marginal product of labor and therefore uh, affecting wages? And really the point here is that one of the points of a macroeconomic model is to try to think about these sorts of scenarios and make predictions. Uh, the predictions aren't always right, but, um, but it's useful to try to make um, some sort of prediction. And, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about is other macroeconomic models um, and the predictions that they made in terms of, of the COVID crisis and what would be a sensible policy response. Um, but again, on my sort of, I guess, obsession with uh, pandemics, I also wrote, again, prior to the COVID crisis, uh, an article that's very much related to my research. So my research is not necessarily on pandemics per se, um, but is on business cycles. And uh, I've long argued um, that the right analogy for understanding the business cycle um, is more of a health analogy than the sort of the typical view of a recession is just this inevitable consequence of an overheating of, of the economy and you just have you know, the ups and downs like a, what I would call a roller coaster ride. That's a traditional view. My view is that, that the business cycle is more along the lines of uh, the economy is in normally in reasonable health or good health, and, but it is hit by shocks. And sometimes uh, you can think of it as like a health shock. Sometimes that 
spreads throughout the whole economy and not just to certain sectors of the economy. And in that scenario, it's, it would end up being a, a full-blown recession. And why that distinction is important is it actually has a very different implication for uh, policy and the response of policy. Um, if you have that roller coaster ride view and you try to stabilize the economy from recessions, you're just going to kind of average out over expansions and recessions and not change um, standards of living over long periods of time. But if you have the health analogy and there's some way to try to respond to this health shock with some medicine, if you will, um, then you can actually raise the average uh, level of, of um, output in, in the economy um, and make everyone better off over the, the, the long run. Um, and then related to that, I have uh, research that shows that actually that the medicine in terms of in particular fiscal stimulus is something that's very dependent on the state of the economy, uh, much like, uh, you know, medicine would be depending on the state of a, of a, a patient. So I'll talk about that, that it's not always going to be effective to pursue certain types of policies, but at other times um, it is. So, um, so this discussion today is really about economics and uh, pandemics and the the key point uh, of pandemics is that of course they obviously have enormous health uh, consequences but they also uh, do have enormous uh, economic consequences and not just the COVID crisis but the Spanish influenza did and actually many other pandemics uh, throughout the 20th century that didn't necessarily spread uh, globally in the same way as, as COVID or the Spanish influenza did have quite large uh, economic consequences uh, from which we can learn some lessons, uh, including about long-term consequences. Um, now, one of the points of putting up my motivation of my question uh, to the, the undergraduate students on the macroeconomics exam a few years ago is that um, the global pandemic such as COVID-19 is something that really could have been predicted. We've had past pandemics um, lots of um, uh, epidemiologists had, had warned us about the possibility of something like this happening and, um, and in order to respond to it, the idea that there would be large uh, economic ramifications and, and uh, consequences. Um, so I would say that it's not a complete shock out of the blue that we had this uh, crisis, um, but, but at the same time I would say that it would have been hard to fully imagine uh, both how quickly um, the crisis uh, happened and what all of the consequences are and indeed what the long-term consequences are we're still trying to sort out and imagine. Um, so that's sort of uh, you know the, the background that we might have predicted it but um, but we wouldn't necessarily know when it would happen and exactly um, how it would play out and, and that's very analogous to economic crises as well. So there really are these analogies between epidemiological and economic crises. And one of the key points is gets to what macroeconomics is about as um, making predictions is it's not a, a science in the sense of a laboratory science where you conduct experiments and you come up with some uh, response, but it's, it's more a, a science like epidemiology where you're faced with making uh, decisions under great uncertainty um, and having to make assumptions in your models about what's going to happen. Um, that are going to ultimately be false, but you're better off still making these predictions um, than just uh, flying blind, if you will, and, and, and not trying to um, uh, grapple with what, what could be happening in the future. Um, and so I'll talk about that and about the role of models and understanding um, the economic consequences of a pandemic and the policy responses in the context of uh, macroeconomic models in particular. Um, so that's my, my plan, is to talk about what we've learned in terms of um, economic policy responses uh, in terms of three key lessons. So uh, let's, let's get on to the three lessons. So the first key lesson um, is about trade-offs. Uh, economists like talking about trade-offs. I'd say microeconomists were sort of obsessed with this idea uh, that there was a trade-off um, that you could sort of uh, do the cold calculation of the, the value of a life um, and trade that off with sort of the uh, economic costs of, of lockdowns. Um, but I think macroeconomists immediately, including those that signed that letter um, to the prime minister more than a year ago, said that that actual simple static type trade-off is really a false dichotomy. It's, it, it's not a lives versus jobs um, trade-off. That the, the true trade-offs in dealing with something like a, a, a pandemic or an economic crisis is a dynamic 
um, it, it's, it's not just what happens today, but what's going to happen in the future and over time. Um, and to understand then the, the costs of a policy, like saying having lockdown policies, restrictions on people's ability to work or shop and so forth, um, have to be thought of relative to uh, what would have happened in the absence of that policy or under an alternative strategy. And economists refer to that as a counterfactual, what would have happened. So um, clearly there, were, there was a recession, um, but is it, is it because of the, the restrictions or the lockdown policies or would have there been a recession in, in any event? And that's what um, an economic model can give us an idea of that counterfactual, that hypothetical, what would have happened um, in the absence of, of the policy. So we need to have these models to understand the dynamic trade-offs. And fortunately, we do and did have these models. So um, uh, there were a number of um, models developed uh, that took basic macroeconomic models and combined them with the epidemiological models, the so-called SIR models, um, that uh, look at how a disease or a, a pandemic would, would spread through the population. Um, and these are the models that were used to sort of justify that idea of flattening the curve, right? That was the idea because there was a worry about overcrowding the hospital system. But that was the uh, basic idea that at some point, maybe everyone's going to to get uh, COVID at some point, uh, unless we develop vaccines at some point in time. But it's, it's about flattening the curve because you don't want to overcrowd hospitals. So um, the macroeconomic model um, took into account those SIR dynamics, so, so how the virus would, would typically spread or how it's modeled to spread, but also took into account the behavioral decisions of households, um, firms, governments, and so forth um, in, in response to this sort of crisis happening. And the key decision that, that, that was involved in, say, this model by uh, Callum Jones and co-authors um, was the idea that, um, that households have a choice of mitigating the spread of the disease by reducing their traditional retail type consumption going out. They could substitute towards, more, say, more online consumption, but it's an imperfect substitute. Or they could um, substitute out of working in, a, in an office environment, but work from home, but they need to learn how to work from home and be as productive. So it's an imperfect substitute. But households can make that decision and they're, they're going to make that decision because they actually, in the model, don't wanna catch uh, the disease. Uh, they don't wanna get COVID. Um, so that's uh, the behavioral background of the model. But there's two externalities. So economists talk a lot, both micro and macro economists, about externalities that, that well, households don't wanna be infected. They don't take into account how much their actions, if everyone else is doing the same thing, is going to affect the infection risk. They're going to take it as a given that there's an infection risk, um, and they're going to decide whether to um, go out shopping or, or work um, in an office or, or do online shopping and work from home um, that without taking into account how their decision is going to affect what the infection risk is. Um, and they're not going to take into account the healthcare congestion externality that is part of just the basic uh, SIR model dynamic that suggests flattening a, a, a curve. So they are going to be concerned about getting the disease, but they're not going to fully take into account um, uh, the effects of their behaviors. And if you have that scenario, uh, what it turns out, what the model suggests is that the, the best policy to be pursued is one that really front loads at, right up immediately restrictions on risky activities um, in order to buy time to develop vaccines. That's the basic uh, prediction of this model that they developed back in March before really actually the, 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 the crisis was just beginning, but the economic crisis hadn't fully occurred. Um, and one key point of that is the counterfactual, which is to say, if you don't have that front-loaded restriction lockdown type policy, you're still going to have a recession. It's going to come a bit later, but it's going to be more severe, and you're still going to, the, you're potentially going to have uh, overwhelming the, the, the hospital system, uh, the healthcare congestion problems. So you'll still get the outcome of a recession, but you'll have more premature deaths in the absence of the restrictions, especially if buying that time in the model, it's sort of a probability that the vaccine will be discovered, but it could it's sort of estimated to be a long way off, maybe on average about two years off, and we actually saw that the vaccines were discovered sooner than that. 
So that's a key point. That's what the model predicted, and that was back in March. And I think that contrasts with what I'll call this myth that was around, and this is just from a year ago, May, last May, um, in the you know, popular media that sort of suggested that there's this simple uh, trade-off. You know, these headlines from you know, the Australian or the Financial Review a year ago said the cost of beating recession was, a uh, the virus was a recession, or Australia's recession is the price of our humanity, this, this lives uh, versus jobs sort of trade-off thing. And the, the whole point is that, no, there would be a recession uh, in any event. And we saw that in countries that had less strict uh, mitigating um, policies and put in place that still had recessions and indeed um, often had more severe recessions. Um, so this is the reality. And so here's a, here's a chart that, that shows that there isn't that trade-off that uh, between lives and, and jobs, but actually it, if there's a trade-off, it's the, it's the other direction that, that um, it's actually quite beneficial um, to mitigate the health consequences of, of a pandemic. And so what this plot here is here, it's going to tell you how much economies contracted um, to July of 2020 over the, over the year to July of 2020. Um, and then on this axis, it's going to tell you deaths per million. So the death rate in uh, different countries. And um, the key point you can kind of see with your, your eyeball is that there's, uh, if anything, this downward sloping relationship that countries that um, had more deaths per million also had uh, uh, deeper economic contractions. Um, the size of the bubbles here are, correspond to the populations of these different countries because so here's the USA is quite large and um, and Luxembourg is in here somewhere, right? And Luxembourg's not quite so large. Uh, Iceland is in here. So those, these are a bunch of OECD economies. And, and um, the key point is that here's Australia, right in this upper uh, left corner, which is where you want to be, um, in the sense that, yes, there was a, a serious recession. Um, you know, uh, GDP contracted oh, year on year about uh, 6 to 7%. Um, but it also, we had a very low uh, death rate, but the contraction was not nearly as bad as many other um, uh, economies. Um, in fact, there's only one country in the OECD that did better than Australia on both counts, which is Korea. Um, there's some economies that had lower death rates, like New Zealand and so forth, and then there's some economies that had less of an economic contraction, at least in that initial uh, stage. Um, but Australia that shows that there's not that sort of basic trade-off. So, so that's the first key lesson, um, which was predicted by the economic models, but actually I think was borne out as well in, in what happened across different countries. Um, the second lesson, which relates to, you know, maybe why does Australia not have that uh, severe economic contraction? Um, part of it was just the psychological effect of not having a, a large number of, of deaths and hospitalizations and um, just the general dysfunctioning of an economy, we were able to open up more quickly um, than, than many economies because um, the, the health crisis was, was managed and mitigated. But the other aspect of it is that um, there were other policy options besides um, uh, opening up the economy or not having lockdowns to try to offset the economic uh, consequences of a lockdown or of a pandemic. Um, and this relates to a key lesson or principle from monetary economics, um, which is that one should always use as many policy tools or what uh, we, we call policy instruments in macroeconomics as you have objectives or you can think of it as targets. Um, and the simple point is you can't hit two different targets with one arrow. So you, if you want to manage the health crisis, you use lockdowns and other mitigating health restrictions to manage the health crisis. And if you want to manage the economic crisis, use some other instrument. And um, the, the argument that economists made a, more than a year ago was to use uh, fiscal policies. Um, why fiscal policies, uh, as opposed to, I said that that idea of using different instruments came from um, the monetary policy literature in, in economics, but why fiscal policies? Well, prior to the COVID crisis, um, many economies, including Australia's, had very low interest rates prior to the crisis. So there was uh, very little ability to lower rates a lot. Uh, to, uh, there's basically interest rates are constrained by what economists now call the effective lower bound. They used to call it the zero lower bound, but Japan and Switzerland and a few economies, Denmark, have managed to have slightly negative interest rates for certain institutional um, lenders. 
Um, but, but basically, um, you can't lower interest rates much when you already start at very low levels. There are uh, unconventional policies and monetary policy can pursue, like quantitative easing um, or forward guidance, which is uh, sort of promises to keep interest rates low, not just now, but for a long period of time. Um, and we know even from the previous global financial crisis, when these uh, policies were used in, say, the U.S. and uh, later in Europe, um, uh, that that actually did spur on uh, some recovery. And mostly it, it, it helped stabilize inflation expectations in economies. We didn't have the deflationary spirals of, of the Great Depression and re reduces risk spreads in financial markets. And so there's some effects, but really limited effects to to actually stimulate the economy and offset that fall in aggregate demand uh, that happens in, in a recession environment. Um, and in particular, monetary policy is very limited. It has very blunt instruments or tools um, to, to conduct policy. So it's very limited in its ability to address the distributional consequences of uh, the COVID recession in particular, and which is very notable and how uh, beyond or unprecedented in how different its effects were across different sectors of the economy. Usually a recession sort of hurts the whole economy, but COVID actually, there were certain sectors that beyond just healthcare, obviously, our pharmaceuticals will say developing vaccines, but um, some sectors of the economy actually uh, did well. Now on net, most sectors did poorly, especially at the height of the crisis, but, um, but there were very big distributional effects and, and a fiscal policy can be much more targeted to try to address that. So what were the, the predictions um, made by economists of how you might address that? Well, the key uh, prediction um, made by economists prior to uh, some of these policies being put in place, um, this, this great paper by Guerrieri et al. Um, she's at Harvard University, argued for um, using social insurance policies to address both the aggregate effects, but more importantly, the distributional effects when a whole sector of the economy gets shut down, um, that can be very uh, more effective than sort of traditional fiscal stimulus policies when you actually have a lockdown environment. And importantly, retains the relationships between uh, employers and employees that we know from hi historical uh, experiences, when you break that relationship, it's much harder to put back together. It takes a long time for people to rematch and find the best job match uh, for them. So the social insurance policies like the JobKeeper program put in place in Australia are exactly what economists would prescribe for that sort of recession, uh, for something where you're shutting down um, part of the economy. Um, the traditional spending and tax cut type policy, fiscal policies may have been less effective because you would expect under this environment of shutting down part of the economy, much higher saving rates. And we, we will see that, I'll show that. But once the economies could open up again, like Australia earlier than many other economies, uh, the fiscal stimulus appears to have offset the other demand shortfalls and, um, and, and actually helped uh, spur on a recovery in, in, in many economies. Um, and this is exactly as uh, would be predicted from previous literature, including work that I've done, research I've done, that shows that stimulus is most effective when there's a large negative output gap in, in the economy. Um, so what I worked on during the COVID crisis was trying to track what the output gap in the economy was in real time. So even before we get the GDP data that comes through after the end of a quarter, we would look at monthly indicators and track, we were able to track this, this sort of huge decline in the output gap to almost negative uh, 8%. This is for the US economy, but then also track in real time this, this uh, very rapid uh, re recovery. And the, the point is that that very negative 8% is exactly when you would have big stimulative effects of policy. But now that we've returned back closer to um, potential, not necessarily the level we were at prior to the crisis, but returned back, um, you wouldn't expect fiscal policies to have quite the same stimulative effects. And you would expect, again, more saving out of, say, tax cuts. Um, so that's a prediction there. But here's the Australian experience. We very much saw that you know, it wasn't as bad as many countries, but, but consumer sentiment really fell a lot at the onset of the crisis, recovered when it looked like it was going pretty well in Australia initially, but then fell again with the, the lockdowns in Victoria. And then it's recovered to an even higher level than it was prior to, to, to the crisis. And I think there's lots of arguments to suggest that that's due to 
um, a surprisingly uh, stimulative fiscal policy and forward guidance in terms of fiscal policy where the, the, the government signaled that they're gonna sustain um, the expansionary fiscal policy um, until the unemployment rate falls um, uh, further. So that was the second lesson was that you can use different tools to address different problems and the economic problem can be addressed by fiscal policy, although not necessarily just in the simple way that you might think for a traditional recession, but including social insurance policies. The third and the final lesson that I want to talk about is uh, long term consequences and here this is, I guess it's a lesson, but it's still a bit prospective or, or thinking ahead what's going to happen. Um, but there were, again, our papers early on by economists looking at his, historical pandemics and making predictions about what would happen. And one of the key tr predictions that Oscar Jorda and his co-authors found looking at a number of past pandemics throughout the uh, history, but also focusing primarily on the 20th century, was that it was a big rise in precautionary saving following pandemics. And this uh, put downward pressure on, on interest rates. Um, and then also that population uh, growth tends to be lower and not just because of the direct effects of, of the crisis. Fortunately, you know, COVID, it's still quite devastating, especially what's happening right now in India. And, you know, the estimated numbers of lives lost total are 5 million, but it's probably 10 million or, or more. But it's not quite the Spanish influenza where it was 50 million worldwide. Um, so it's not just about the direct population loss, but Pandemics have traditionally led to lower population growth for a while related to this. It's a psychological effect with higher precautionary saving. People are just more cautious, if you will. Um, and so basic economics would predict if we do have these dynamics again uh, with this pandemic and maybe even on a larger scale because it was a global pandemic, um, that we'll have low interest rates and higher real wages. Um, and that's sort of what we've seen. So this is for Australia. This is the household saving ratio um, going back to around 2004. And, you know, it had kind of before the crisis tracked down to below 5%, um, but just jumped way up uh, with the onset of the crisis. There was a, a big increase in, in saving. Um, it's fallen somewhat since then, but still is its high sustained levels. And then, you know, the, this was in the news um, a few months ago about Australia uh, posted actually a decline in its population for the first time since 1916. Um, part of that with Australia is a lot of population growth happens from uh, net migration and that of course was um, put on hold given the border restrictions. But also um, it, it does affect just sort of natural population growth rates as I noted in the past and, and I just saw the New York Times on the weekend had a big article about globally population growth rates have fallen um, quite dramatically uh, following the, the, the COVID crisis. So it, as was predicted, uh, it seems to be playing out in this case and the consequences will be, um, you know, uh, lower interest rates and, and actually potentially higher uh, real wages going forward. So to summarize um, the talk before we get to sort of questions and answers and so forth, the, the three key lessons is first that in terms of trade-offs, they're dynamic trade-offs, and the dynamic trade-offs mean that you, what you want to do is front-load mitigation restrictions um, and to buy time to find vaccines, which actually turned out to be exactly what, what happened. I'd say the vaccines arrived earlier than maybe uh, would have been expected when, um, when, when we were making these sorts of predictions. Um, and so there's not just a simple static trade-off. And with the dynamic trade-off, if you can actually reduce the consequences of overcrowding of hospitals and high death rates, you can actually have a better recovery. Um, so economies that, that manage the health crisis tended to even do better uh, economically. Uh, the second lesson is that fiscal policy is really crucial to take up that slack and um, aggregate demand for the economy that seems to arise with uh, pandemics due to higher precautionary saving and of course other economic forces. Um, use a different policy tool to address that part of, of uh, the global crisis, if you will. And then the third um, sort of lesson is that COVID isn't just about a temporary blip, even if we saw you know, some recovery in terms of economic activity, and we're gonna continue to see that, I think as more data comes in this year. Um, there are still going to be long-term consequences, economic consequences from um, the, the COVID crisis. And that's going to include, I think, very importantly, this shift in population dynamics. 
Um, but the overall lesson I'd say is that economic models which are imperfect um, and uh, always abstract from certain things like epidemiological models do, um, they're still very useful to provide predictions, um, including predictions about the effects of pandemics and the policy responses. So we can understand better what would have happened um, in, in the absence of those policies or in, under different policy responses. And in this case, because different countries pursued different responses, we've actually seen that uh, those predictions play out along those lines. So those are the, the, the lessons I wanted to talk about. Um, I did want to do something, which is um, have a, a, a quiz. Um, and so hopefully this will work that you can um, at home there scan the, the QR code here. Um, or if, if you don't have access to the QR code, just go to this website and enter in this, this number for um, the, the survey. Um, because I, it's a survey, it's not that there's a, a right answer, but I want to get a sense of what you think um, uh, would have happened, one of these counterfactuals. So here's the, the, the setup, it's about Australia, that the Australian unemployment rate before the crisis was at about 5.2%, and it rose quite quickly in the crisis, not as much as, say, in the US, where it went up to, you know, 14%, but it, it peaked at about 7.5% in July 2020, and it's since come back down faster than I think a lot of economic models actually predicted, because traditionally unemployment takes uh, longer to recover or come down after a recession, but it's come back down to about five and a half percent by uh, the April numbers, the most recent number. Um, so that's what's happened. My question about the counterfactual for you is what do you think the Australian unemployment rate would have peaked at um, in the absence of the JobKeeper program, the social insurance program, and other fiscal measures? Um, and I've given you four options. It may not be the exact number you have in your mind, but choose the one that's closest to your best estimate. And those are 5.5%. Uh, so, you know, that would be a very optimistic view, it basically, you know, kind of where we are now. Uh, so a lower peak than what actually happened. Seven and a half percent. So exactly what actually happened. Um, so that you, I guess you would be thinking it didn't depend on those, those fiscal measures. 10%. Um, or 15%. So uh, those are the options. Um, I, the quiz should be there. I'm going to go and um, do it. Hopefully you've had access to it already. Um, so I'll just keep it short. So we'll do, um, should be counting down. Uh, stop in one minute. So we'll do one minute left uh, to answer that and I'll be um, curious to see uh, what, what your answers are in terms of what that counterfactual would be. But one of the key points is, how do I think about this quantitative prediction of what it would be? And that's what a, an economic model can allow us to do. We, we set out what our assumptions are, uh, what the mechanisms are um, of the effects of the policies. Um, we can look at the quantitative aspects of the policies and make a prediction, quantitative prediction for what would have happened under the alternative scenario of not having the big fiscal response of the social insurance policy or other fiscal measures. So we're just uh, coming down to um, the last 10 seconds or so of, of the quiz. So um, I'll look forward to seeing that. Um, but just as uh, before I, I, I do look at what the results are with the quiz, I'm gonna tell you what Treasury's answer was to this. Um, so the Australian Treasury basically answered this question. This was um, at the previous budget back in, I think it was in uh, November, October, November. Um, they, uh, for, they, they published what their models, which uh, thought about what multipliers would be for different policies and different sectors of the economy, uh, predicted the effects of the COVID crisis would have been on the unemployment rate um, in the absence of uh, the fiscal measures that they, they undertook uh, versus their predicted path um, given their measures. And so their prediction is up around 13 and a half percent. So they, I guess, Treasury would have voted for the, the, the last option of 15% uh, is the closest one. Um, and then their prediction of what happened with uh, the economic support was um, that peaking around seven and a half percent and they did predict a bit slower decline than we've actually seen. It's come back down um, uh, to about five and a half percent at a faster rate. So that's the, the prediction of, of Treasury. And um, I'll, I'll just uh, see if I can put up, I'll put up the, the, the results so you can see. So I'll stop sharing that and I will share.
the results of the quiz. So here we go. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. And, um, oops. Yeah, I'll just put it there. And it looks like, okay, the, 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 the highest vote was for 10%. Um, uh, so definitely, I, it sounds like generally you think that there, there was an effect in the sense that the peak was lower. Um, but there is a few people that uh, certainly uh, predicted maybe no, no particular effect or, or perhaps these policies have made things worse. But, but I would say a big majority here, more than um, it looks like 86% have uh, voted that, that it would have been much higher. And, um, and even 32% are voting sort of on the, on the level of what um, Treasury uh, had in mind of what the alternative is. So um, let me just bring that back up, the Q&A, and then um, and take any, any questions that you might have at this point. So any questions out there? If you have a question you want to put in the queue, oh, there is something in the Q&A box. Okay, I'll look at, um, okay, so uh, yeah, here's some good questions. So one is, you know, how, uh, how could uh, Australia have handled the better. So I've, I've sort of argued that Australia has done relatively well compared to many other countries, but that doesn't mean that it was optimal or, or the best possible policy. Um, and so how could, could it have handled things um, better? So I think one of the um, aspects on the fiscal policy side that I would say is I was sort of surprised. I it was a bit of a pivot for um, the coalition government was, you know, sort of pushing the idea of returning to surpluses and, and uh, when the crisis happened, um, abandoned sort of that, that aspect of their policy. And I think that was the right response given the, the crisis and the, what, what I've suggested uh, before, that that's the right tool to use, especially given that monetary policy has been limited. Um, but one key uh, thing that, that would be important um, in terms of the fiscal policy response is trying to make it clear that what would be a sustained response for so that people have the confidence that you know the the um the measures aren't just going to be withdrawn and and so there there was a, a drawing down in particular of the social insurance policy and that had to happen at some point of time but signaling the framework and the time frame for that i think initially was um maybe not as as clear as it might have been and um, part of that previous budget that I had the chart from talked about um, that the policies would be in place until um, the unemployment rate was comfortably below 6%. Um, and that's sort of a very general, almost vague language. Um, and, and so now uh, Treasury's revised that to being a bit more specific that actually they're pushing towards their forecast for the unemployment rate over the long term would be actually below 5%, somewhere closer to 4.5% and in line with what the Reserve Bank of Australia's uh, forecast would be. So that would be, I suspect, one, one answer of how it could handle things better. And then on monetary policy, I think, again, uh, the Reserve Bank acted quickly with a number of unconventional policies, but took a bit of time to be very uh, explicit about the forward guidance. Now, they've now done that very explicitly, saying they don't expect to raise rates until um, early 2024 at the earliest, and they're going to signal in terms of their yield curve control um, when they start, will start to expect raising rates um, in terms of which forward government bond uh, right now is a three year um, government bond that they're targeting, but which particular maturity they'll target. Um, so I think being, if you're using forward guidance uh, as a way to shore up confidence in the economy, it's, it's important to be explicit. So that would certainly be one um, aspect in terms of handling the policy better. Um, I, I would also say that, you know, it, the lockdowns are a very blunt um, uh, way to, to, to manage a crisis. You know, what Victoria did in terms of going from the highest rate of COVID to, to zero anywhere in the world, uh, 
at least pre-vaccine, is, is remarkable. Um, but th there are issues with just having stopping and starting of, of the, um, the economy at short notice every time there's a, a few cases. And so a very clear thing I think that the government could have done better and draws from an economic principle is diversified much more in buying options on different types of vaccines up, up front and or even having not done that been willing to use more of the, uh, the fiscal stimulus uh, to actually purchase vaccines um, and have a vaccine rollout as, as quickly as possible to allow an opening up of the economy uh, much faster uh, once you have the vaccines in place. So I think that would be something I would say that, that could have been done much better. So thanks for those questions. Um, so a question here is, did Australia handle it well because COVID did not hit the country as hard as other, as other countries? Um, so there is always a question of, you know, is there an element of luck in terms of the timing? You know, borders were closed early on, which looks, again, exposed to be the right strategy. Uh, that's part of a sort of a lockdown um, approach and to do that front loading those restrictions is, is important. Um, but there is a question if it kind of just gets away from just being able to do uh, basic tracing, uh, what, what can you do? And I guess I would say maybe Victoria provides us again with um, an example of if, if things do get worse, is it still the right policy to, to, to bring the economy or bring things back down to uh, very low numbers and not treat it as sort of this simple trade-off um, between the economy and, and lives. And I would say, again, that actually the Victoria uh, situation would support the idea that there's dynamic trade-offs and you're better off managing the health crisis. Um, okay, it looks like there's some other uh, questions in terms of, oh, uh, subjects and topics that I teach in the Master of Economics. Um, and how did I decide on the area of economics research? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so I teach exactly on um, uh, basically the um, advanced macroeconomics in the master's program, which is Econ 6002, where we cover the main macroeconomic models that are used to look at uh, it, policy issues related to long run growth, um, policy issues related to business cycles, so both monetary policy and fiscal policy, and, um, and sort of theories about how households uh, make their economic decisions in a dynamic environment and how firms make their economic decisions. So households about how much to consume or save and firms how much to uh, invest. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the courses uh, that I would teach in the Master of Economics. And how did I decide on my area of research? I actually started out doing more research on financial uh, data and financial markets and, and, and how they behave. But um, a lot of the same tools and techniques, statistical techniques, can be applied to um, macroeconomic data. And I was, uh, I'm Canadian originally, but I was in the US during the global financial crisis. Um, and it was such a, a huge event economically um, that it just seemed much more uh, compelling or interesting for me to study um, what are the causes of recessions, what are the dynamics of recessions, are there different types of recessions, and what can policy do in terms of those recessions. So um, that's how I really shifted really into macroeconomics, which is an area that I'm quite um, passionate about and, and excited about. And um, I, I do, do think that uh, when we were in an economy like Australia prior to the crisis where we had, had 27 years of expansion, and no recession. I would understand that most people just don't care about recessions or don't think about them. But um, now that we see um, a recession and, and the, the effects of it and, and the role of policy, um, I do think it's an exciting time to be studying uh, economics and macroeconomics in particular. Um, someone's asked here, uh, as the job keeper has stopped, uh, it will definitely affect uh, house mortgages um, and real estate market. <laughs> what do I think? So this is a great Australian pastime is to, to try to predict the real estate market, which is certainly booming at this, this time. Um, it's an interesting question of what the consequences of job keeper stopping um, will be. Thus far, it doesn't seem to have had a big effect on, on the, the labor market. So it may have served the, the role of keeping in a lot of industries, in the broader macro uh, economy sense, a lot of industries keeping those relationships intact, but uh, job employer employee relationships intact and, and, and so it's no longer needed for the broad industries. I do think though that there are many sectors and uh, tourism is an easy example, but many sectors that are still 
um, very much affected by um, by the, the the crisis and and the restrictions we still have in place, including the border restrictions and so forth. So um, it would make sense to have more targeted programs. It maybe it always would have made sense to have more targeted programs, but um, but the first order thing was to get a big response and prevent you know massive unemployment like we saw in in many other countries, including the U.S. Um, I think now is the time for more targeted programs um, for, for certain industries that are particularly affected by COVID, but still temporarily affected. I think other industries may just fundamentally change as a result of COVID and there, I think there's a better role for um, support for job retraining and, and other policies uh, to respond to that. Um, someone's asked, do, do I think we'll have another roaring 20s followed by an economic depression? Uh, what's my best prediction? So yeah, the roaring 20s. Well, the stock market certainly has done surprisingly well, um, and I guess the property market's also sort of booming. Um, I do do think, you know, this idea that there will never be another economic crisis. Um, in the early 2000s, when I was in the US, people talked about this great moderation and that policy has fine-tuned things and solved all these crises. That, that was always a, a myth. There's, there will always be more economic crises. What will be the case is the source of them will change every time. Um, whether it's about a property bubble like in the US or whether it's about a pandemic like what we're going through now, it's gonna be, there will be another crisis. Um, the source of it, I, I don't know where it will be from. Do I think, I think the question is asking whether I think it might be coming from an over exuberant uh, stock market. Um, and, and maybe property market as well. Uh, I, I think that's a fair um, question. It is always a risk. Uh, I guess I would say, if that is a risk and a worry, how should policy best respond to it? And this is one thing I think has been a good shift for the Reserve Bank of Australia had previously put a fair amount of weight on, on property prices and thinking about keeping interest rates higher than otherwise even though inflation had been going below um, the, the, the RBA's target uh, range for, for a, a number of years. Um, I think it's best that the blunt instrument of the interest rate, the policy interest rate focuses on the, the key target, which is the inflation target, and that other um, policy responses are used to try to uh, prevent an over exuberant property market. In particular, the, the big lesson from the US crisis is to really minimize um, you know, the no interest down, no, you know, very, very um, uh, risky uh, how home loans that were made, the so-called ninja loans, uh, no income, no job or asset loans that were made. Um, and to also recognize that there are, um, could be systemic risks in the financial sector if, if a lot of uh, what look to be safe assets are actually ultimately backed by something that if there was a big, you know, a drop of property prices of 20%, um, could have a more widespread effect. So I, I do think there's a role for policy to respond to it, but, but again, you want to be more targeted and not just use blunt monetary policy. I, I think it would be a mistake for the Reserve Bank to start raising rates too soon, because even if they're worried about the property market, they should have other policy responses in, in terms of that. Um, Someone asked, do you think consider Australia followed or was inspired by other countries? Uh, well, I mean, it was around similar time to uh, New Zealand um, and this notion that islands have a, a benefit. Um, Taiwan, of course, uh, is, is, is uh, done quite well in terms of uh, the crisis and managing the crisis. Uh, so there's sort of this idea that islands have this effect. But, um, but no, I think, um, I think it was, there was sort of idiosyncratic reasons why Australia responded exactly as it did. We learned a lot about um, politics, not just economics and you know, the sort of the federation and the role of states and the uniqueness of the different states in Australia really came to the fore again. Um, but that, that national cabinet that was in place was um, I think an important part of, of getting the, the response. And, and I guess I would also say listening to experts, uh, epidemiological experts, medical experts, and at times even to uh, economic advice. Um, you know, the Treasury um, uh, was really uh, pivoting and listening much more to uh, what I think economists had suggested were sensible responses to previous crises, um, as well as the RBA sort of shifted uh, its responses to be similar to, um, say, what the Federal Reserve did after the global financial crisis.
Uh, there's a question about JobKeeper be kept on post pandemic on a permanent basis. So um, I guess I wouldn't think JobKeeper should be kept on a permanent basis. That's really, you know, a wage subsidy to um, firms that have a big drop in revenues. Um, you can see why that might be a bit problematic um, on an ongoing basis to sort of reward firms that might not um, uh, be doing, doing well. At some point you have to let markets play out and firms have good revenues or weaker revenues when the economy returns to normal. But job seeker, um, I think, is uh, something that could be reformed. And part of the, the crisis response was were more generous benefits with job seeker, but also ones that um, would could taper over time, uh, more like uh, employment and insurance uh, programs in Canada or even the US. Um, I think there is a role to reform or change um, uh, some of those um, employment insurance programs, because that is one thing that's very hard to get private insurance for is a recession. Uh, it, it, you might, we might all want to buy a policy against recessions, but uh, it's hard to do. The closest that's come is apparently Wimbledon. They, they actually had pandemic insurance, and so they didn't, they didn't lose any money by not running Wimbledon last year. But I don't think there's going to be a lot of insurers right, um, offering new pandemic insurance policies uh, going forward. So that's where there's a role for that social insurance. And, and I think um, uh, reforming job seeker could be part of that. Um, how did I decide to do a PhD? Uh, that's a, that's a, a great question. I guess one uh, I thought about, I came from a, a family of an academic and a lawyer. My father was an academic, my mother was a lawyer, my older brother was supposed to be an academic, I was supposed to be a lawyer. We rebelled by switching. But for me, it was actually I, when I went and studied economics as an undergraduate, I thought, oh, I'll go off and work in finance and make lots of money. Um, but I discovered I really loved teaching. So that was, that was part of why I decided to go and do a PhD. And I, I have no regrets of it because uh, as I say, it's been exciting times uh, to be studying macroeconomics and to be teaching macroeconomics. And I think what economics, even in an undergraduate setting, but going all the way through to a PhD does, is it teaches you how to think very flexibly about a very changing world. Um, and that's what we're in but to come up with models to sort of see principles and be able to make predictions. I always give an example of, you know, suppose you were working at Treasury and you had to figure out, you know, who are Australia's major trading partners gonna be 100 years from now? How do you start to answer that question? Well, economics provides some tools and means. It's not that you're gonna know for sure, but you can, you can do better than just a wild guess or a stab in the dark. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of my answer with uh, how I decided to do a PhD. Um, someone asks, if interest rates are increased, should we expect the property bubble to pop? What impact? I think you would have to raise interest rates quite dramatically to uh, offset um, property prices. And it, it, it's, it's analogous to the gold standard. So, you know, what the gold standard was about was targeting the price of gold rather than an inflation target is about targeting the price of all the goods and services that we consume. But gold is a relatively volatile price, you know, so it's, a, it's sort of crazy to try to stabilize that one price. And that's the same with property prices that um, properties are like an asset price, they do fluctuate and move around. It's, it, it may be a bit frothy or bubbly, but there are also some fundamental reasons why property prices are going up uh, right now, including these very low interest rates and, and um, expectations that they'll be low for a long period of time. And we all discovered in the lockdowns that um, we might be spending a lot more time in a housing environment. So people are sort of, uh, including working from home. I think that that's gonna be, a, not, not in every industry, but there's gonna be more and more of that. And so it sort of is natural that you have a bit of a shift uh, in preferences towards um, uh, property uh, as opposed to say foreign travel or things like that. Maybe that will shift back when borders open up, but, but it doesn't surprise me that um, property prices uh, have gone up in response to the crisis. Um, I mentioned the stock market and the economic depression. What about a uh, crypto market? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. I, I guess, what can I say about Bitcoin? Uh, my advice is don't, don't, um, don't get caught up in Ponzi schemes. Okay. I'll leave it there. Uh, what are the long-term effects of uh, this pandemic? Are there any positive effects? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, mostly on net, it's going to be negative effects. It's pretty an awful thing. It's, it, and one shouldn't just think about it as lives lost. I, I, this will sound a bit grim or philosophical, but we're all going to die. It's 
when we die and under what circumstances. And um, that's what was horrifying. And even in the early days of the pandemic in Northern Italy or New York City, you saw these images and now in India, um, it's just, that's really a, a devastating um, negative event for humanity. Um, so I, I would mostly focus on this as being really a negative uh, event. I do think there, there will be some changes in the whole structure of the economy and some of them will, will potentially be beneficial. An example right now is we're all sitting wherever we're sitting without having to travel in the same way um, to have conversations. So obviously, um, you know, I wouldn't say invest in Bitcoin, but maybe Zoom, you know, Zoom would, would have been a good thing to invest in um, or other telecommunications. That we're gonna see more of that. It doesn't replace, it's not perfect substitute, doesn't replace everything So you need for certain communications. Like I would go to academic conferences. It wasn't just about a presentation, but it was about the discussions behind the scenes where you really did a lot of learning about um, things. But uh, so I think we'll have some of that, but we'll have less of it. And, and there may be environmental benefits to that. You know, again, India might come to mind that early on in the pandemic with the lockdowns, people could actually see the Himalayas for the first time in 20 years because of a reduction in air pollution. Um, so there are some you know, positive effects, I suppose. Um, is there difficulty for economists to convince the government of the day to take particular action economically uh, if it contradicts the party line? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, uh, economists aren't always very good at politics. Um, I think it was Harry Truman who was the president in the U.S. Um, he had this line, of, he, he said, give me a one-armed economist because he said they always come in saying on the one hand this and one hand that. And, and so we're, we're going to be thinking through all these different possibilities and qualifying things and, and not thinking about sort of the political aspects of of different policies and, and there always is a political reality to how you implement policies and so forth. Um, but I, I think the best that we can do is um, try to communicate these models that we have as clearly as we can and communicate the principles behind um, what, what's behind our predictions as clearly as we can. So again, I, I would say, you know, I interact with the Reserve Bank of Australia, with the uh, Treasury, I'm on the, their um, panel of um, uh, forecasting, uh, I'm a, an external member on the panel and, and look at you know, their, how they came up with that prediction, for example, of what the effects would have been. Um, I think more interaction like that is very helpful in both senses, but it's also helpful to us as uh, economists to figure out what would be a useful thing for us to, to study and, and analyze. Um, okay, just a couple more questions. I see we're running out of time, but we got, is it easier for a developed country to implement cash transfer measures in such times than developing countries? Um, uh, the question is a bit more technical, but someone's definitely studied macroeconomics because the range of the population's marginal propensity to consume is smaller. Also, if that's true, does it mean developing countries can justify not distributing cash gen generously? Um, I mean, I think that clearly Australia was in a lucky position uh, as a lucky country, as a developed uh, economy, to be able to use fiscal policy in the way it, it could. You know, Latin America, you know, Argentina comes to mind as a, a comparison. Um, the, the economic crisis is much worse um, as well as the medical crisis, but it's partly worse because there aren't the abilities to use um, fiscal policies in, in the way that Australia I was able to with one of the lowest GDP ratios prior to the crisis. Um, so I think it's probably not just about sort of a technical thing about how effective cash transfer policies would be given different marginal propensities to consume. I think I, your point is completely right that you would have different marginal propensities to consume and a different distribution of that in a developing economy than a developed one. But the first order effect is simply that there are it's very hard, um, say, for uh, developing economies to use debt financed um, uh, spending to stimulate the economy. And then they have limits on how they can raise funding to try to address the, the crisis. So I do think there's a role, um, a big role for uh, developed economies to think about um, how can they help because a global recovery is going to be important. This is a global crisis, a global recession the global recovery is key. You know, the engines of growth aren't just domestic. They're gonna be, last time with the global financial crisis, it was East Asia's growth that brought the, the rest of the world 
out of the global financial crisis and kept Australia out of a recession. So, so that's going to be important this time to see, to have developing economies definitely being part of the engine of growth and recovery. Um, people, uh, this sounds like a good last question. People tend to distrust economists. They, they predicted five of the last three recessions. Do you think the pandemic response has improved that level of trust? And what can be done to gain that trust? I, that's a hard one to say because I think there, not all economists are homogeneous in their predictions. I, there's a little bit of macroeconomists who are much more um, thinking about these dynamic trade-offs, and but there certainly would be a, a large number of microeconomists who thought in a simple cost-benefit sense and static trade-offs who maybe were out there fairly publicly making arguments that we should just, you know, quote unquote, let it rip, uh, which I, I think was very mistaken um, sort of a policy prescription. But some economists would have argued for that. I certainly wouldn't deny that. We were all, you know, we didn't all have the same view. Um, how do we, imp do I think it's improved the level of trust? I think with say policy makers, and by that I, I mean people say in a treasury or, or central banks, um, in the US a lot of the uh, economists in the central banks, you know, Janet Yellen or Ben Bernanke were academic economists, so they, they would ha naturally have a higher level of trust. But I know I think, uh, I would hope, um, that what the crisis showed is that that there can be expertise in terms of policy responses and maybe another way to put it is it was surprising how much uh, regardless of left or right governments were in different countries there was a fair amount of a fiscal policy response um, and social insurance response across many economies so um, so what can be done more well i guess it's again just trying to articulate um, what the predictions of the models are and how they can be useful and um, and I suppose I have a, a former co-author who, uh, who always said when you get a prediction right tell everybody because we don't get them right all the time so it's a, it's important to um, you know blare the trumpet and tell people when you get it right well I say we're past the time so I should probably uh, stop there but thank you for all all of those those great questions and and for for listening and I hope you found it interesting and of course, if you have questions about the, the, the master's program and so forth, um, you can contact me or also there's uh, direct contacts in the university. So um, I'll end there and uh, thank you very much and hope you have a good night and um, thanks again.